Well, hey, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome back to the channel for this installment of Open Mic, the show where the mic is open, the floor is, as they would say, yours. What are the things you guys want to discuss and talk about? That's what we're here to do. I'm, of course, your host, uh, John Campia. Good to have you guys here. Uh, now, first of all, let me apologize for the fact that uh, we indeed did not have any open mics last week. For those of you who watch the show on a regular basis, you guys know last week I was sick all week, and it was it, it took a lot for me just to get through... Um, doing the main shows last week. It took a lot just for me to get through the shows. So I'm about 80% better here. So I thought we can get back to doing uh, open mic here today. And it's good to have you guys here. Now, there are two different ways uh, for you guys to get a topic or question on open mic. One is if you are watching this video, any of the 23 hours a day that we're not streaming live, go ahead and use our tip link at www.streamelements.com slash John Campia slash tip. You can also find that link down in the description. Or if you are watching live right now, and hello to everybody who is watching live, uh, go ahead and use the super chat feature in the live chat and we will get to those uh, in just a little bit. And obviously some stuff happened today that we need to touch on here. Before we get into the other stuff, and I'm sure you guys are going to have a lot to say about this, um, when uh, the Jonathan Majors thing has been a predominant piece of news uh, because he is the main figure of an entire couple of phases of the biggest movie franchise in the world with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, of course, playing Kang. Now, he's only had the chance to play Kang a couple of times, Loki Season 1, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, Loki Season 2. but a lot of the next coming phases were actually kind of planned around uh, that character and what he was going to do. Then, of course, I think it was March. I think it was March. Back in March, uh, reports came out that Jonathan Majors got arrested for alleged assault and all this kind of stuff. And then a trial happened. I mean, at first, the his lawyer said, this is never going to go to trial. But the district attorney looked at the evidence, said, no, we think there's enough there to bring to trial. Then Jonathan Majors' attorney uh, made a motion for to dismiss the case, but the judge looked at it and said, no, there's enough evidence here for us to have a trial. And then now apparently a jury of his peers, a jury has said that he's been found guilty on two of four. There are two counts of the charges that he was acquitted of and two of the charges that he was found guilty of. We talked about that a little bit today. And now, very quickly... Marvel moved and has parted ways with Jonathan Majors. Um, the news came out very shortly after the verdict came in that Marvel Studios has dropped Jonathan Majors following the guilty verdict for harassment and assault. Now, we're going to take a moment here. We're going to read a few of the paragraphs from this report coming out of Variety. I mean, obviously, Marvel had already decided if he's found innocent we're going to move forward. If he's found guilty, we're going to part ways. Um, so it, obviously that decision had already ma been made. Like if he's found innocent, we move forward. If he's found guilty, we can't move forward with him. And so they decided not to waste any time, not to spend days having everybody online, including us, including you, wondering, are they going to drop him? Or are they not going to drop him? As soon as the announcement came out that he was found guilty on a couple of charges, they decided to part ways. Uh, now let's get over to the article here. And uh, and see what was going on here. OK, so uh, and this is pretty interesting stuff. Marvel Studios has parted ways with Jonathan Majors, the actor cast to play Kang, the central antagonist in the multiverse saga of the Mar uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe after he was convicted on December 18th. That's today of two misdemeanor counts of harassment and assault of Grace Jabari, his ex-girlfriend, a source close to the studio, confirmed the decision to Variety. In the verdict, Majors was also found not guilty of one count of intentional assault and the, in the third degree and one count of aggravated assault in the second degree. Those were the other two charges he was facing, and he was acquitted of those. All right, the actor was arrested back on March 25th. Uh, blah, blah, blah. This is all stuff we've already covered before. The 34-year-old actor denied that he assaulted Jabari. His defense team has alleged that she was the aggravator or aggressor when she took his phone. Now, this is where it gets kind of complicated. We talked about this last week. During the nearly two-week trial, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office released a series of disturbing texts between Majors and Jabari in an and an audio recording 
that has been used as evidence, including messages in which Major seemingly attempted to persuade Jabari against going to the hospital following a head injury, and a message in which Jonathan Majors threatened suicide. Uh, in the audio recording, Majors tells Jabari that she needs to act more like Coretta Scott King and Michelle Obama because he is a great man who is doing great things, not just for me, but for my culture um, and the world. And you guys remember we talked about that last week, the text messages and the phone messages came out in which Jonathan Majors, even though she was complaining of major symptoms, Jonathan Majors tried to convince her not to go to the hospital and in the text message he said because even if you lie to protect me they're going to want to investigate and stuff like that and we said at the time listen he may be guilty he may be innocent but whether he's found guilty or not guilty those text messages aren't a good look and it's going to put marvel in a very difficult position and then of course the phone messages and and stuff like that and and you know we didn't know at the time whether he's going to be found innocent or guilty or whatever but we said this is going to be a really tricky spot for Marvel. Well, very quickly, uh, the jury came to a conclusion and they found him guilty on two counts, one of uh, an assault and one of harassment. And again, Marvel clearly had already made up its mind, right? If the jury comes in and he's innocent, great. If the jury comes in and he's guilty, well, then we've already made up our minds and we're going to part ways with them. So it was, they were just waiting to find out what was going to be going on there. So now the question becomes, number one, what happens with Jonathan Major's career? Number two, where does Marvel go from here? So let's start with what happens to Jonathan Major's career. In my opinion, you know, and we talked about this on the John Campy show earlier today, because to me, the two charges that he was found not guilty on were the were the slightly more serious charges. I mean, none of them are good. They're all bad, okay? Uh, uh, don't get me wrong. Don't misinterpret me. I'm not saying, oh, those charges are nothing. No, I, but I'm just saying that the two he was found not guilty on were kind of the more serious ones, um, if you wanted to rank them or whatever. And I said on the show today, I said, I think this puts Marvel in a very interesting position because I think they could go either way. I said, I think they could look at this and say, say, this is not good. Jonathan Major is going to have to go into some kind of PR tour, an apology tour. But we think we can still move forward and do this with him. And I said, Marvel could also equally go, hey, listen, this is too much of a PR headache. This isn't baggage that we need right now. We're dealing with enough baggage. We're going to have to part ways from with him, right? And so I said on the show this morning, eh, interesting position that they're in. They could maybe go either way. But I guess, um, I guess the fact that, you know, the text messages that came out that looked really bad um, and all this kind of stuff were, were just too much for Marvel to overcome. So... Jonathan Majors ain't going to be in this. And it's going to hurt him in, in the short term. It's absolutely going to hurt him in the short term. No doubt. Um, but do I think this is a death sentence on his career? I don't think this is a death sentence on his career. Um, I really don't. I think his career is going to take a hit. Absolutely. And it already has. He's lost some projects already, even before the verdict came in. Um, he lost, you know, some of his representation dropped him and all this kind of stuff. And I think there will be more stuff uh, going forward that he's going to suffer some consequences from. And yeah, I, so it's, there's going to be a repercussion and there's going to be um, damage done. But Again, I don't think it's the charges he was actually found guilty of. Let me, a little bit of interpretation. The assault he was found guilty of was basically, it is, he didn't intend to hurt her. I think the one count he was found not guilty of, that charge basically amounted to he intended to injure her. The one he was found guilty of is essentially them saying, we don't believe he intended to hurt her. It was inadvertent. Still his fault. He's responsible, 
but it wasn't intentional, right? And I, while some people may think that's a very small distinction, I think to a lot of people, it's going to be a very important distinction. And I think there's going to be a period of time he's going to have to pay his pence. Listen, here's the other thing about celebrities. If any average person out there was found guilty of what Jonathan Majors was just found guilty of, the price they would have to pay is nowhere near as severe as the price Jonathan Majors has already paid. Because Jonathan Majors is a celebrity, now the whole world knows about it. Some average person does this, 99% of the people will never even know about it. Jonathan Majors has been subjected now to public humiliation, and I'm not saying he didn't deserve it, I'm, I'm just saying, understand Jonathan Majors is suffering consequences that a lot of average people wouldn't suffer. He's been subjected to public worldwide humiliation. He's suffered major damage to his career. He has suffered major financially. Like the, the stuff he's lost, is, it adds up to the tens of millions of dollars that he's lost as a result of it. And again, he was found guilty. It's his own fault. He put himself in that situation. I'm not saying otherwise. I'm not trying to say he shouldn't have any repercussions. Don't misinterpret me. I'm just saying he has paid a price and he's going to continue paying a price. But I don't think that price will be the end of the day. I think at the um, end of the day, five years from now, I think he will be acting again. I think, I don't know if he's going to be um, like A-list in, in everything again, but I think he he will have a chance to come back. People love a good comeback story. And I think the things he was found guilty of, while they need to carry a punishment, I don't think those are things that should surmount to a death penalty for his career. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a huge fan of him as an actor. And obviously, full disclosure, you guys know I'm a big fan of Jonathan Majors as an actor. When they announced he was playing Kang, I practically threw a party. I love this guy as an actor. I think he's tremendously talented. But that has nothing to do with it. So... Yeah, so uh, the district attorney believed there was enough to bring him to trial. The judge said there was enough to continue a trial and rejected their motion to dismiss. And now a jury has decided that he's been found guilty. Okay, so what's going to happen in his career? He's going to suffer some major setbacks, a lot of public humiliation, and get hit really hard in the pocketbook. I don't think he's going to go to jail. What he's been found guilty of, just so you know, carries up to a uh, potential one year in prison. I do not believe they're going to send him to prison for this. I think he's probably going to get parole, public service, you know, th that sort of thing. So he's going to suffer a lot now, but I ultimately think his career will be able to continue on a couple of years from now. Whether that's true or not, we'll have to wait and see. Now, the second thing, what happens when Marvel now has to move on? What is Marvel going to do? All right, well, they have, I believe, three different options available to them now that they've parted ways with Jonathan Majors. Option number one is, well, sorry, three, two. There are two different options Marvel has. <laughs> Option number one is recast Kang, right? And recasting Kang is the easiest thing in the world. I mean, in this multiverse... Um, that Marvel has set up. They've already shown that Spider-Man variants can look and sound completely different, right? You have a Tom Holland Spider-Man, you have an Andrew Garfield Spider-Man, you had a Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. Who's to say that there can't be another Kang that looks different than Jonathan Majors looks, right? So easy, poof, easy peasy, easy to recast the role, super simple. Even easier than the idea, like, I personally think Marvel should have recast T'Challa after the tragic passing of Chadwick Boseman. I think the better way to honor Chadwick Boseman and what he did with that character is to carry it on. They chose otherwise, that's fine. But this is even easier to recast because another variant can look like anything. Right? Can look like anything. Doesn't have to look like just like Jonathan Majors. The Marvel multiverse has already established variants can look different from each other. You have Loki and you have Sylvie. They're both Lokis, completely different. So you can easily recast Kang if you want to. So that's option number one, is recast Kang. 
The second option is to what some people have already speculated before the trial even started, what Marvel might do, which is to just brush their hands of the whole Kang storyline and move on from Kang. The Kang storyline has not worked, in my opinion, so far. Um, and when you look at the end of Loki season two, we talked about this when Loki was on. If you look at the end of Loki season two, it they wrapped it up saying, okay, great, we're done. The TVA is now going around and cleaning up all the remaining Kang variants. That's what the TVA does now, go around and just hunt Kangs. And they can say they moved on from it and move on to another storyline with a new antagonist, whether that's Doctor Doom or whether that's Galactus or whether that's Squirrel Girl. I don't care, whatever, they could move on to something else. So those are two very valid options that are available to them. And actually, I'm going to right now, I'm gonna for those of you who are watching live, I'm going to start a poll asking, uh, will Marvel recast Kang or move on from Kang? And we're going to say uh, recast, and we're going to say move on. I'm going to say, which one do you think of those two options do you think they're going to do for those of you guys in the live chat? Unless you guys think there's a third option. I, I don't know what the third option is. I mean, the third option would have been to continue on Kang with Jonathan Majors, but they've clearly now made that decision that they're moving on. They're, they're no longer going to be working with Jonathan Majors. So right now, we just put up this uh, poll, and so far, 325 of you have already voted, and it's close. 59% of you say move on, and 41% are saying they're going to recast. That is much closer. I thought most of you would have thought they were just going to move on and say like 80% move on. And it's getting closer. Now 58% of you, we're at 450 votes. 58% of you are saying that they're going to move on. 42% are saying they're going to recast. So a lot of possibilities there of what they can do. Um, now again, uh, this is going to come with a degree of Controversy either way. Listen, I think we can all have our thoughts about whether he should have been charged, whether he should have been found guilty. Um, you know, we can all have our, everybody can have their own opinion about the evidence and all that kind of stuff. But what I think most of us can agree on, and correct me if I'm wrong, all right? I think whatever side you fell on, I think most people will agree that with the text messages out there and the voicemails that with a jury coming back with a verdict of guilty, whether we think he was guilty or not, okay? Help, work with me here. Put, take whether you thought he was guilty or not and put that aside for a second. Whether you thought he was innocent, whether you thought he was guilty. Take that, put that aside for a second. Is it fair to say that most of us would agree that with everything already going on, with a jury of his peers coming back with a guilty verdict on a couple of charges, can we all agree that at that point it's understandable that Marvel would part ways with him? Can, can we agree on that? Like whether you personally thought he was guilty or innocent, can we agree that with a jury coming back with a guilty verdict, with this, it's now official, he's been found guilty, that it's understandable that Marvel would go, well, listen, he's been found guilty. We need to move on to another actor. Because none of this is Marvel's fault, right? Marvel didn't charge him. Marvel didn't bring, bring him to trial. Marvel did this. None of this has anything to do with Marvel. This is not Marvel's fault. Marvel has nothing to do with this. They're just sitting there going, great, one of our actors got themselves in trouble, and now they've been found guilty in a court of law by a jury of his peers. And whether we agree or disagree with that, he's been found guilty. So what does Marvel do? I'm not saying that made them have to fire him, but I can, can we at least agree that it becomes kind of understandable that they'd have to part ways with him? I, I think that's fair to say. I think that's fair to say. Look, bottom line, end of the day, I think he is a remarkable talent. I love watching him do his craft. He's fabulous, and I think he will be back. He he just won't be back. Um, uh, I just don't think he'll be back 
as, you know, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now, a really good question is being asked in the live chat. And if I can find it, uh, again, I will bring it up. Oh, there it is. Here, here it is. Blackjack is asking, what happens to Magazine Dreams? That That is the exact question I was thinking of when I was driving back to the office this afternoon. Is what this movie that apparently early buzzes is really good where Jonathan Majors plays a bodybuilder and pursuing his dream and it's called Magazine Dreams. The movie got delayed um, to an undetermined release date and um, now what do they do with it? You know, Blackjack said, maybe does it go direct to streaming? Maybe. Maybe it goes direct to streaming. Um, maybe they just shelve it. Maybe they shop it around to somebody else. Say, look, we we can't touch this right now. So, hey, Universal, you want this movie? Hey, Paramount, you want this movie? Hey, Warner Brothers, you want this movie? Hey, A24, hey, hey Amazon Studios, hey, Apple TV, you know, hey, Crackle. Anybody out there want this movie? I, maybe they do that. Um, yeah, not really sure. I, you know what? Um, this is a pessimistic way of looking at it, uh, Mex guy, but Mex guy writes, yep, I hope they shelve it to not face any backlash and negative stuff. That might be their best PR. I hate saying it because I want to see this movie, but Marvel's best option, unfortunately, might be just to shelve it and, and just make it go away, <laughs> which would suck. I want to see this movie, but yeah, we'll have to see <laughs> maybe, maybe to be. Maybe Tubi is the place for this thing to go. Uh, yeah, maybe. Not sure. Okay, guys, listen. <clears throat> if you guys have thoughts, theories, and opinions about this, go ahead and use the Super Chat feature in the live chat. We're going to get to those as much as we can. Uh, but for now, we're going to move over and start taking live questions. Well, first of all, we're going to start with the uh, tip link questions that have come in, and then we'll get to the live questions where I'm sure a lot more of you guys are going to have some things to say about the Jonathan Major situation. And... Um, Let's just get into it here, shall we? We're going to start off here with Stink King, who writes, I disagree with you about critics leaving reviews on Rotten Tomatoes for shows they only saw a few episodes of. Their score is still counted in the total reported score of a show, so if it has a 70%, who knows how many of that 70% actually like the whole show? I don't disagree with you on that, Stink King, but here you're leaving out another, you're leaving out a very important piece of this puzzle. The critics who were only watching a part of the show are not doing so out of laziness. They're, no, they're only watching a part of the show because they're only being given a part of the show. Right? Like the people who are reviewing like the first four episodes or something, they're reviewing that because the studio don't have the balls to give them the full series to let them review the whole series. So, <clears throat> and it is... The, the, the critic's responsibility to put out their critique of something to help average viewers like you and me make informed decisions on if we want to watch it or not, right? So <clears throat> if, if all that is available is, hey, listen, Disney only gave the first three episodes to critics. So are you saying critics shouldn't then say what they thought of what they were showed? Like what I think in a perfect world, Stink King, in a perfect world, what should happen is that the studios give the full series to the critics to review and then they can put out the review of the series, obviously with some embargoes on there to not spoil anything, but that's what should happen and then they should review the entire series. But if the studios are only going to give them a couple of episodes and that's all they have to go on and, um, and then that's the case then that's what they got to do. All right. Uh, we move on here. Next up, uh, that's the wrong button. Uh, we've got uh, the best to do it rights. Should movies move off these big game release weekends, knowing uh, from past games have logged over 100 million online played hours in its opening weekend? That's a weekend box office killer. No, as a matter of fact, I remember it was Forbes. I think Forbes did this like in 2000. 18, 2019, something like that. There was that report in Forbes that basically looked at that and statistically it showed that big movies coming out didn't really have a drop-off 
from other big movies of its equivalents on opening weekends on the same weekends that big games came out or that big TV shows came out. Because there was this big thing done about movies, t big TV shows dropping, and uh, big games dropping. And it was shown that there really wasn't that big of a disparity uh, between a weekend that a big game did come out or a weekend that a big game didn't come out or a weekend that a big TV show dropped and a weekend that a big TV show didn't drop. They really showed, their, their stats showed there wasn't much of a difference. So I don't think that's going to play into it. All right. Now that could change over time if behaviors change, behavioral patterns change. But for now, it doesn't statistically, apparently it doesn't make much of a difference. All right. Uh, let's see here. Ricky writes, I'm a straight white guy, and I have loved Taylor's music from the beginning. Tired of boys in this community making judgments of Taylor's talent, even without seeing her perform. No mention of her releasing the movie on rental and looking at uh, a China release. Um, yeah, listen. Taylor Swift. Listen, she's a, she's a really good artist. Her music is not necessarily my, you know, lane. It's not the lane I drive in, necessarily. But... Listen, she's incredibly talented. As somebody who dabbled in in songwriting myself, you know, I played at ba I played in bands for a lot of years. Um, I'm I'm just telling you, she's a very very talented artist. And, you know, Beyonce says she's a generational talent. She just she is. I mean, her music doesn't have to be in my lane for me to acknowledge she's a generational talent. Uh, I mean, she just really is. That doesn't mean she has to be your cup of tea. Certainly doesn't mean she has to be my cup of tea, but uh, she's a pretty ridiculously talented artist and all the musical artists think she is too. So it's kind of up that lane. Anyway, uh, next up, we've got uh, Funky Buddha writes, thank you, John, for introducing me to Warrior. Binge season one over a couple of days on sick leave from work. The action, the characters, the storyline, very underrated show. Yeah, listen, man, I love Warrior. Uh, I've only just recently started season three because it was so many years in between seasons, but I absolutely fell in love with that show with season one, season two. I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying it, man. It's really unfortunate that it got canceled in season three, but the reality is with so many years passing in between seasons and it was never a huge show to start with. Season three just hasn't been able to find its footing or get an audience back. And so I, I understand them. Um, canceling it. I do. It sucks, but I understand why they did it. I love that show though, man. I really do. All right. Uh, Indira from Winnipeg writes, I love Winnipeg. Peacock lost $2.8 billion in 2023. Freddy's, uh, I assume you mean five nights at Freddy's didn't boost their numbers much. It took them three years to reach 30 million subs. They have the biggest churn and the most poorly rated. Can Peacock realistically compete? It makes no sense unless there's a merger coming, is there? Here's the thing about Peacock, though. In the world of movie studios, they are run by probably the richest of the movie studios, which is Universal, you know, NBC Universal Comcast. And they have deep, deep, deep pockets. As a matter of fact, they just made eight to nine billion dollars from selling their share of Hulu back to Disney. They are flush with cash. And they seem to have a plan. Now, listen, um, Peacock, I still load up Peacock um, to watch some of my favorite shows. When I want to watch The Office, when I want to watch Parks and Rec, stuff like that, I'm loading up Peacock. Uh, obviously, if you want to watch Five Nights at Freddy's. I think, though, they're not willing to give up on it. I think they're, they're, they're going to want to give it five years, I think to really get into the pattern of their theatrical releases, then go on to Peacock and see if they can make some, uh, some noise that way. But yeah, if this keeps going like this for another couple of years, they may be looking at um, probably closing down the division and start licensing out their content. Uh, maybe we'll have to see. All right. Next up, we got Suthius who writes, finally took my oldest to see minus one. A plus, one of my favorite iterations of Godzilla so far. One thing I immediately noticed was how small he was. Did some uh, Googling, and sure enough, he's not even 200 feet tall. Very reminiscent of the older iterations. Yeah, uh, especially if you've seen Minus One, when you first meet Godzilla in Minus One, it's the smallest iteration of Godzilla we've ever seen. Now, he's bigger later in the film. 
but I thought he was the perfect size. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. And, and by the way, Minus One, I think, is my all-time favorite Godzilla movie. Uh, I loved it, and I thought Suthius, he was the perfect size in this one. Sometimes I think they portray him as being a little bit too big. This one, I thought he was just perfect. All right, Sam Fisher writes, I don't watch Hallmark movies, but I read this in a tweet and figured you would get a kick out of it. Rick Hoffman, Lewis in Suits, was in a Hallmark movie this weekend, and in the movie, he has a brother named Harvey. It's so dumb, but I kind of love it. Has he really relegated himself to being in Hallmark movies, or was this an older Hallmark movie? I mean, that guy, I, I, look, I would love to see Suits make a return, and I really, really like him. Uh, I love Lewis in Suits. He's so good. Uh, by the way, wasn't he also just in Thanksgiving? Help me out in the live chat. But was Rick Hoffman, the guy who plays Lewis in Suits, was he not just in that that horror film that was just out in the last couple of weeks? <clears throat> uh, Thanksgiving? Wasn't he in that? Correct me if I'm wrong. Michael Pinedo is saying, yes, he was. Yeah, it was really good. I loved him in that show, man. I really, really loved him in that show. Um, all right, next up. We go to Tack, who writes, something people forget is that Disney has always had periods of massive success followed by years of mediocrity and bombs after some poor decisions. They always find a way to recoup and rise to the top again, and I see no reason why it won't happen again. No, listen, you're absolutely right about that. And it's not just Disney. Everything happens in cycles, right? Everything happens in cycles. The, you know, Buffalo Bills won the AFC championship four years in a row. And then they disappeared to mediocrity for a while. Dallas Cowboys won a couple of Super Bowls. And then they went on a big, long slump. Um, Edmonton Oilers won five Stanley Cups. And then they became bad for a while. And then they get good again. And they like, but the same is true in, in stuff like this. It's, it's always going to happen in cycles. And, um... I have every belief that they will get back to where they need to be. How and what that will look like, not really sure, but we'll see. All right, thanks, Tack. Next up, uh, we've got Full Boil, who writes, Hey, John, do you know if the merging between Hulu and Disney Plus will have any effect on Hulu's live TV service? Uh, do you think any changes will be made to it? That is a great question. And you know what? I haven't thought much about Hulu's live TV service in a long time. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Hulu, like Sling TV and like YouTube TV, Hulu has a service where you get you, you, Hulu TV. You can get cable TV channels through your streaming service on Hulu. And <coughs> pardon me. That is a great question. I have not thought of that in a long time. Um. I don't know if this is going to have any impact on that. I mean, it's a totally separate tier, right? It's a totally separate thing. You don't get Hulu TV just by being a Hulu member and by just having Hulu ad-free, whatever. It's a totally separate thing. So here's my guess, and it's only a guess. I think they will rename that service and take the word Hulu out of it. Um, or they might just close it down. Like, I don't know how it ranks compared to Sling TV or Spectrum TV or YouTube TV. I don't know how they rank as far as the broadcast cable TV on streaming thing competitors go, but I've got my guess would be, and it's just a wild guess, is that they'll just rebrand it but keep it going. But we'll see. Good question, Full Boil. All right, BK Dan writes, John, I could be mistaken in my ignorance, but saw the shot list for VFX Oscars, a short list for VFF Oscars. Um, how can something... BR Bond TE shortlist when it hasn't even gotten out, please educate. Okay. Well, this is the same question that comes up a lot. Like, wait a minute. How can somebody be already get buzz Oscar buzz for best picture if it hasn't come out yet? How can so-and-so, and it happens every year, nominations come out sometimes and somebody will be on a nominee list for a movie that hasn't even come out yet. It's because Oscar voters get to see those movies well in advance. Uh, that's why and that's how. And if a movie's being submitted for uh, best um, visual effects, then those studios would have sent the movies to all, even the movies that haven't come out yet, to the visual effects branch of the Academy and sent it to them and um, they get to see it and they'll do it. So yes, while the public hasn't seen it, 
the branches, whatever branch is responsible in the academy for nominating certain categories, they will have seen it already. So just so you know. All right. Next up, Garden Variety Vagabond writes, Sean Gunn, the modern Pia Zadora. How's that pull from the archives? That's that's a deep cut. And you listen, no, like, I, I we, we made a topic out of this on the show the other day about, listen, um, Nobody bats an eye when Martin Scorsese works with the same actor again and again and again. Nobody bats an eye when Tim Burton works with the same actors again and again and again. Nobody bats an eye when Quentin Tarantino likes to work with the same actors or so-and-so director works with the same actors. James Gunn is no different. And one of those actors happens to be his brother. And if he knows he can work really well with this actor, whether it's his brother or not, and he likes the performances he gets out of this actor, then... You know, everything's fine. I, I really don't see a problem with it. I really don't. Anyway, uh, kind of good Canadian kid writes, Hello, John. Love your show. I've been noticing a lot of movie reviews recently mentioning whether a film or a scene in a film is woke. Only idiots will ever bring that up. Also, uh, whenever I tell my friends I watch a movie, their first response is usually, was it woke? It seems... Um, that everybody is using that word nowadays. I was just wondering, in your honest opinion, what makes a film woke? Is it just a film that just pushes a certain message upon the audience? Thanks and have a great day. Well, look, I'm not going to go into my full uh, soapbox kind of thing here, but basically is this. Whenever I hear somebody use the word woke, what I see is a person who objects to the ending of the agenda of exclusion. That's usually what, when you see one of these crybabies whining about, what that usually is, is they're complaining that this proud, long, century-long agenda that Hollywood has had of excluding everybody out of the movies except for straight white males. Um... As soon as they see somebody stopping that agenda and not using that agenda anymore, they cry woke. Here's a great example. Did you guys know, let me know in the live chat if you know anything about this. In the comic books, for any of you who, who watch or read comics, um, you know the character Nightcrawler? Well, they just changed Nightcrawler's backstory uh, a bit where now everybody's always known Mystique was one of Nightcrawler's parents, right? So now what they're saying is that Nightcrawler is the son of Mystique and another female character. That is that Nightcrawler is the child of two um, female characters. And the way they described it is, you know, when Mystique takes on the physical likeness of a person, they're take, she takes on their full anatomy, right? So she and the woman she loved, she when they would have sex, she would turn into a male and would be able to have sex with her and she have, she'd have sex, right? Now, here's what's really interesting about Destiny. Thank you, Globe. It, it's Mystique and Destiny. Now, that's kind of interesting, but here's where it gets really interesting, okay? So the, the guy who created the story, Chris Claremont, legendary comics guy, Chris Claremont, he originally wanted that to be Nightcrawler's origins. Chris Claremont's original intention for Nightcrawler was that Nightcrawler was going to be the child of Mystique and another female mutant, but Mystique changes into a guy to have sex with the girl and hence that's why they were able to have a child but he was stopped from using that storyline because there was an agenda in the entertainment business that no 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 you can't have lesbians bad get rid of that and they didn't let the creator go with the story that the creator wanted to go with it was the original intention of Chris Claremont for this to be the origin story. But he created it during an age when there was this heavy agenda against anything that remotely resembled diversity. And so they forced Chris Claremont to change it and come up with a different origin story for Nightcrawler. 
Um, and now you've got writers at Marvel going, you know what? We're going to take this back to the original creative intention of the creator. That's what we're going to do. Because we no longer live in an era where we have to follow that old agenda of exclusion. We no longer live in that era. So now we're free. So the creator can, we can make this what the creator always intended it to be. And I think that's a good thing. By the way, there's a great video on this made by a YouTuber that goes by the handle of Comics Explained. I think that's the name of it. I think it's Comics Explained is the name of it. Anyway, he does a great breakdown of this and you should go and really check that out. But I mean, yeah, to basically what it is, as soon as some very scared, frightened little children that pass themselves off as men, but really they're just frightened little children who get scared at the shadows. As soon as they see a movie or a TV show that is no longer enforcing an agenda of exclusion, they get scared. They get frightened. And what do children do when they're scared and they're frightened? They cry. That's what little the baby children do. They cry as soon as they feel scared and frightened. And seeing society taking down that old agenda of exclusion is, it, for some reason, it scares the shit out of some people because they're not real men. <laughs> they, they have no sense of self-worth or security in and of and who they are and confidence in themselves to not be threatened by other people. But that's the society we live in. A bunch of scared little children. And when scared little babies get scared, they lash out and they scream and they cry. And they, in today's terms, they yell, woke. And by the way, there are certain films that, that uh, these people will call woke that are truly bad films. And they're bad. They're not bad because they're woke. They're just bad because they're bad. I mean, it's, it's no getting her on that, right? I don't care how many white, black, Asian, lesbian, straight, transsexual, whatever you put into a movie. That doesn't make a movie good. You still got to make a good movie. <laughs> if you make a crap movie full of diversity, it's still a crap movie. Got to still make good movies. But yeah, it is what it is. All right. Let's keep going on here. Uh, next up, we got uh, Dark Sky who writes, Hey, John, uh, thanks for all you do. Curious if you are still considering changing the name of the show. No, uh, I just remembered that for some reason. Uh, here's uh, three names I came up with. Awesome Entertainment, The Fan Base, uh, TVMT, TV and Movie Talk. No, yeah, there was a, a good long period of time where I was considering changing the name of the John Campia show uh, to something else. Uh, actually, we even picked a name and we started going through the process of things we'd have to do, but... You know, ultimately, I just hit a point where it's like, you know what? Nah, I, I, you know, I mentioned this in my vlog the other day, uh, my, my poker and answering questions vlog. Somebody was asking about, you know, the changes I made earlier this year and stuff like that. It's, you know, I always said when I was doing the John, when I started the John Campy YouTube channel back up, I said, what I don't want to do is make AMC movie talk 2.0. Or, and what I don't want to do is to create Collider Movie Talk 2.0. Um, I want it to be more smaller feeling, more personal, you know, things like that. But what happens is when you're running a business, and this is a business, when you're running a business, I got swept up in like, well, you want to keep growing and you want to grow and you want to expand. And all of a sudden we were doing like, a, you know, two shows a day, sometimes three shows a day. I had at one point like seven staff people and we moved into this great new office. I love the office we're in. I really do. But I mean, I, and we we're going to change the name for corporate reasons and, and all this kind of stuff. And I just, you know, back around March, I think it was, I just made a decision. It was time to downscale because I was getting too into like just dangerously close to making my channel AMC Movie Talk 2.0 again. And, and I don't want to do that. And not, there was a bunch of other things I talk about also in the vlog there as well. But no, ultimately, I pulled the plug on changing the name of, um, of the channel. So no, not changing the name of the main show anymore. Although that is something we really looked at for a number of months. All right. Next up, we've got 
Uh, Duck Duck, who writes, Buenas tardes. How do you feel towards licensed music in movies and shows? It rarely elevates anything for me, but can really take me out of something. Spider-Verse is a good example of how to use licensed music. Amazing score as well. But something like Omni-Man and Debbie walking to some sad music completely falls apart for me. It feels like a cheap way to try to make me emotional. Weirdly enough, I think they used Radiohead uh, efficiently in the opening of the first episode to set the vibe of season two. Well, I mean, but that's that's true of any element of filmmaking and storytelling, though, right? Licensed music is like anything else in a movie or TV show. It's a tool in the storyteller's belt, right? And it can be used well. James Gunn's Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, or it can be used poorly. The score, the orchestral score in a movie can be used well, or it can be used badly. Visual effects can be used well, or they can be used badly. Costumes can be executed well, or they can be executed badly. Licensed music is just another tool. If you pick the right music at the right time and use it the right way, it can elevate a scene. Uh, a great example of this, one of the movies I like to refer to back a lot is um, Clerks 2. And in Clerks 2, there's the one scene where, you know, the, the main character is kind of driving around town, really trying to evaluate which direction he wants to take his life in, right? And as he's driving around town, they play the song, um, oh, what's the name of the song now? Boom, 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 boom. It's by us, us, um, not, what's the name of the band again? Dun, dun, 19, dun, 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 Do you guys know the name of the song? John, you're just humming stupid notes. That makes no sense. Do you guys know the one I'm talking about? Bald lead singer, uh, lead singer, uh, not Smashing Pumpkins. Is it Smashing Pumpkins? Is that the name of the band? No, is it uh, Smashing Pumpkins? It is Smashing Pumpkins. Marco Polo is saying, yes, it's Smashing Pumpkins. 1979, that's the name of the song. Dun, 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 You don't even care, boom, boom, reckless as we... Anyway, it's it's a perfect use. A fan is saying, grab the guitar. I would grab my guitar, except I don't have it in my office here. I've got it in my office at my house. Uh, but anyway, it, that's a perfect use of a song. That is the perfect use of a song in a perfect moment that really elevated the emotion of what was going on with the character. And then sometimes the totally wrong song is put into a scene. So my feelings on it are like any other tool in the storytelling process. It can be used right. It can be used wrong. It, it all depends on if you pick it right. I think that's the main thing, Duck Duck. All right. We're going to take one more question, then we're going to take a short break here. Uh, this one comes to us from Garden Variety Vagabond, who writes, John, I've been uh, binging Monarch and For All Mankind. Uh, we could add more to this list um, that all have amazing writing. I doubt that it is a coincidence. Do you think that they buy excellent projects or are excellent at developing them? Probably talking about Apple TV+. Plus. Apple TV+, Plus is absolutely fucking killing it. I've only watched, I haven't watched everything on Apple TV+, Plus, but of all the Apple TV+, Plus stuff I've watched, I've only seen one thing I didn't like. And that was Jason Momoa's C. And I love Jason Momoa. Everybody knows I love Jason Momoa. But uh, yeah, I just, I didn't like C. Okay, so that that's that. But everything else they did, they've done. Ted Lasso, Shrinking, uh, Severance, um, uh, Monarch, Morning Show. I mean, it goes on and on. You guys could probably name about 15 more shows. They have been absolutely killing it. They're doing such a good job. And I think it's it's a mixture of both. I think it's they know how to pick the right pitches and um and, and pick the right scripts. I think they just know a really good thing when they see it. And they're and they're not going for massive quantity dumps, right? They don't do the Netflix thing, and I'm, I'm not disparaging Netflix, I'm just saying, they don't do the Netflix thing of just put out as much as we possibly can. Put out every single thing we can. Like, just green light everything, and just hopefully a couple of them work out well. 
Apple TV Plus has been very, very deliberate and very selective about what they bring to production and then what they put out. And man, they've been killing it, dude. They've been absolutely killing it. Um, all right. <clears throat> let's keep going here. Uh, let's see. Garden Variety Vagamos writes, and by them, I mean, Apple. yes, I picked that up, Garden Variety. I understood you were talking about Apple. Thanks for the follow-up, though. All right. Uh, you know what? I said we were going to take just a, a brief second to uh, thank a couple of sponsors of our show here today. So hang tight, guys. Grab yourselves something to drink, talk amongst yourselves, and enjoy these fine spots about our wonderful sponsors today. Check it out. We want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's episode, Rocket Money. Do you struggle to save money every month? With Rocket Money, you can quickly identify all those sneaky subscriptions that keep charging you month after month and cancel any you no longer use. For example, did you know that over 80% of people have subscriptions that they've completely forgotten about? It's too easy to subscribe to a free trial of something and then completely forget about it once you stop using it. That's why I'm such a big fan of Rocket Money. I've told you guys before that when I started using Rocket Money, I realized that I was still subscribed to a gym in another city I had moved away from two years ago. Also, my music Music service? Yeah, I found out I was still subscribed to two others. How much do you think you're paying a month on subscriptions? Most people think they're paying 80 bucks a month, but they're actually paying closer to 200. That's why I use Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. With Rocket Money, you can easily cancel the ones you don't want with just the press of a button. With over 5 million users and counting, Rocket Money has helped save its customers on an average of $720 a year and $1 billion in total total savings so far. So stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash campia. That's rocketmoney.com slash campia. Rocketmoney.com slash campia. Guys, we want to take a second to thank the sponsor of today's video, Quip. Good health starts with good habits, and Quip makes forming good dental habits easy by delivering all of the oral care essentials that you need to care for your mouth. I've already told you guys about their incredible toothbrush that is now my favorite toothbrush I've ever owned, and their mints and gum are amazing. But now I want to tell you about their water flosser. It hits all the right spots with gentle or deep cleaning pressure at the touch of a button. And don't worry about recharging. The cordless rechargeable battery lasts up to eight weeks with daily use, no bulky charger, or dock or tangled cords. It blasts away up to 99.9% .9 of plaque and popcorn from treated areas with precision thanks to the 360 degree rotating magnetic floss tip that snaps right into place. It's easy to control water flow that leaves you feeling squeaky clean. And the sleek and slim design, it keeps your countertops as clean as your teeth. So guys, if you go to getquip.com slash campia right now, you'll get 20% off any electric toothbrush, mint and gum dispenser, and water flosser. That's 20% off any electric toothbrush, mint and gum dispenser, water flosser at getquip.com slash campia. Spelt G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash campia. Quip, the good habits company. And thank you to our friends at Rocket Money and Quip for sponsoring today's episode of Open Mic. All right, guys, let's get back over to your questions here, shall we? We're going to pick things up here with Samuel C. who writes, regarding recent movie titles, I think one, Godzilla Minus One implies Japan had already lost everything at zero post-World War II. Yeah, we already covered this on the show. Before Godzilla showed up to take them one level down, yep. Uh, X in Godzilla X means times or multiplied. Somebody told me that X is essentially used in Japan to represent verses. I, I guess, I mean, I still don't know the answer to that, but that's that's just what I've heard so far. I don't know enough about the Japanese culture to know that for sure, though. All right, Tristan Thorpe writes, feels like every time I see the Madam Web trailer, the worse it gets for me. Definitely going to pass on it. It also doesn't help that I haven't liked the three Spidey spinoff movies Sony's put out. Maybe the second trailer can spark some interest. I gotta tell you, I am very interested in Madam Web from the concept of the movie, but the trailer, the trailer was okay. The, my big problem with the trailer was that all the dialogue being delivered sounded really wooden to me. Like, it sounded really wooden. He was in South America when my mother was there studying spiders. It, and that's concerning. Now, listen, I love Venom 1. I really liked Venom 2. I hated Morbius. We'll see how Craven the Hunter turns out. We'll see how Madam Web turns out, all that kind of stuff. But... I hope the second trailer is better than the first. Let's just say that. I hope the second trailer is better than the first one was. All right. Next one. 
comes to us from Ahsoka was a fun show. I'm glad you feel that way. Writes, one of two, regarding Rebel movie reviews, I have to disagree with you when you say that critics don't have it in for the guy. Uh, I'm no Snyder bro, but after reading that hit piece of a review in THR, it's obvious that some critics do indeed despise him. Anyways, uh, on to my question. The production and VFX quality in Rebel Moon look way better than recent films with bigger budgets. With the box office so unpredictable at the moment, should studios look at Rebel Moon as an example of how to make films in a more economic fashion? Okay, well, first of all, Ahsoka was a fun show. You're ignoring the facts. Like, these same critics that people are saying, they just have it out for Zack Snyder. They gave his last movie pretty good reviews. Like, his last movie, Army of the Dead, Last I checked, I think it has over 200 reviews from the big outlets too and stuff like that. And while it wasn't universally loved, it has a really respectable 68%, which means a vast majority of the critics liked it. 32% of the critics didn't like it, but 68% of them did. So these same critics, so your whole argument that the critics have it out for him. Well, his last couple of movies they gave positive reviews to. Did they not have it out for him before? But now they... Is it possible? Is it possible that they just watched the movie and didn't think it was good? Is, is that not possible? Is that not possible? That they just didn't watch Rebel Moon and while they may have liked his last movie, Army of the Dead, because big majority of the critics gave that movie positive reviews... Is it not possible? Is it so unthinkable that they then sat down to watch Rebel Moon and said, this isn't good? Now, I haven't seen the movie yet. I, I'm looking forward to seeing the movie. I, 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 of all Zack Snyder's films, I only have one I didn't like, and that was Sucker Punch. I have literally liked every single other Zack Snyder movie that he's ever done. Some of them I love, and I'm looking forward to seeing this movie, but... This whole thing of making up excuses, like don't make excuses. They just have it out for them. According to what? Prove that. Prove it. Well, because they didn't like something I liked. Well, that means they have it out for the guy. This is the same group of critics that have given positive reviews to his HBO version of Justice League, gave positive reviews to Army of the Dead. What happened in just the last couple of months that they suddenly turned on? So no, I, I reject that. Get that garbage out of here. I completely reject that. That's just stupid. They simply watched the movie and they didn't like it. I may like it, and but that's okay. We're all allowed to like different things. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to feel the need to make up an excuse. If they hated the movie, they hated the movie. If they like the movie, they say they like the movie. It's just as simple as that. Some people just can't accept the fact that other people may not like things they like or may like things that they don't like. And then they start to make up excuses. Anyway, so, so take that out of here. As far as the visual effects quality, I'm not terribly certain I think the visual effects quality and what I've seen from Rebel Moon, a, a movie I'm, I'm excited to watch, I'm not convinced that anything I've seen in the trailers looks way better. Like, I don't think anything in that looks way better than what I've seen in Foundation. I don't think it looks way better than anything I've seen in some in a bunch of other stuff. And granted, mostly we've been seeing these trailers on little YouTube videos and stuff like that, so it's hard to say until we sit down and actually watch the movie. I think, that, by the way, I'm not crapping on the visual effects either. I think from what I've seen in the trailers, I think the effects look quite good. I think they look good. But I, I don't think they look way better than things we've seen other wells. Anyway, either way, I'm looking forward to seeing this. Maybe I'll like it. Maybe I won't. But uh, I'm looking forward to giving it a shot and see how I feel about it. All right. Next up, we got Suthius who writes, Looking at the story for the Jurassic World trilogy, the bulk of it was in the hands of Kevin Trevorrow and uh, Derek Connolly. Rise of Skywalker's story was by them, and Connolly also wrote Monster Trucks. Uh, I don't think this is a good filmmaking duo there. Well, I mean... Uh, and I think you mean Colin, uh, is it Kevin Trevorrow? Trevor, do you mean Colin Trevorrow? Uh, either way, you might be right. I, I might be off on that. Guys in live chat, am I, is the name actually Colin Trevorrow or was it a, was the writer actually called Kevin Trevorrow? I could be wrong about that. I, I might be delirious still from all the cold medication I've been taking. Uh, either way, yeah, sometimes you... You look at lists of credits and you look at resumes and it, it, it makes you ask in my best Chris Carr impersonation for why, 
I'm like, why are you giving this person the ability to do this? But listen, it's, sometimes it's all hindsight. Like somebody may come up with a great pitch and then maybe it just doesn't execute well, right? So it happens. It happens. All right. Uh, next up, we go to Murray Reich, who writes, one of two. I know some of the viewers of the show watched Saltburn and liked it. Uh, I'm unfortunately not one of them. While Barry did a phenomenal job, I found the film a bit boring in scenes and sad, but most of all, at least three to four WTF moments that I left feeling sick. I was, oh, sorry, uh, there's still more to it here. Uh, I've never really seen, uh, I've never seen Fennel's other movies, so maybe uh, I don't have the same appreciation as everyone else did, but it just came across very weird, strange uh, eroticism. Hope you enjoyed it though. Listen, <clears throat> I finally got around to watching Saltburn and I think it is artistically a beautifully put together movie, artistically. I did, however, and I enjoyed it. I thought the performances were great. I did, however, walk away with a little bit of a sense of mother Remember Mother um, with Jennifer Lawrence and The Lighthouse with uh, Robert Pattinson and Willem Dafoe? I had, I mean, obviously a very, very different movie, but, but like artistic direction, it kind of had that same kind of feel to it, which... I still don't know how that works for me because like I think about The Lighthouse, that is still a movie to this day that when I walked out of the movie, I'm like, what the hell was that I just watched? I, I just don't know what that is that I just watched. Um, I still get that feeling today. I still wonder about that. And Mother was, I don't know what the hell they were thinking with that, but artistically gorgeous and all that kind of stuff. And I had a little bit of feeling of that with Saltburn, but it, I, I see where you're coming from, Murray. I completely do. All right, next up. Sam writes, hey, John, my team played Wrexham on Saturday and I saw Ryan Reynolds from a distance and didn't know Kevin Feige was there, too, until we left. Otherwise, I might have waited for a photo. Not many chances to see him in the UK would have uh, eased the pain of losing. Um, Listen, uh, first of all, who was your team? I'd be curious to know who your team is that was playing against Wrexham. And it makes sense that Kevin Feige would be there, right? Like Kevin Feige is now in business with Ryan Reynolds and... You know, if Ryan Reynolds invited him to come out to attend a Wrexham game, Wrexham is a show that's on, Welcome to Wrexham is a show that's on a Disney channel. It's on Hulu. Uh, so it makes kind of sense. If they're working together, invite him to come out. I mean, we've seen Hugh Jackman, Will Ferrell, other of uh, Ryan Reynolds' friends at Wrexham games. I've been at a Wrexham game. Um, but um, that was just in San Diego. Uh, but I mean, yeah, so it's not surprising it would have been there, but yeah, that would have been cool to be there in the stadium and seeing Ryan Reynolds and Kevin Feige there together. All right. Uh, next up, we go to Jay Wince, who writes, John, I'm getting really tired of Zaslav's bullshit, money saving with all the shelving and then canceling winning time. And now the worst thing he's ever done, canceling Warrior. I hope Netflix saves it. But again, sick of this bullshit. I think it's rather ironic, Jay Wince, that you brought up Netflix because nobody cancels shows early more than Netflix does. Can we all agree on that? Can we all acknowledge that? Do we all agree? Nobody cancels shows early like Netflix does. I mean, they're just known for that. Like two episodes in, cancel. Like they, they've done it a million, million, million times. Here's the reality. Nobody was watching Winning Time. I love that show. Nobody was watching it. And as Robert Meyer Burnett has pointed out to us a lot, when shows go into their third seasons, prices go way up. Higher fees for producers, higher fees for crews, higher fees for the actors. Uh, new all this. So the expense goes up. Expense gets higher. But they weren't getting the audience. And, and like, I'm, I'm sorry, Jay Wentz, but it's not like they created canceling shows that are too expensive for how little viewers they bring in. This has been, that's a century of television. John, television hasn't been around a century. I know, but you know what I mean, right? That's what everybody does. Listen, Warrior, I love Warrior. I've been an evangelist for Warrior for years, but the reality is, 
it didn't get an audience for its season three. It was never big viewership for the first two seasons to start with, and it didn't get a very good viewership response for season three. And they decided to cancel it. Dude, that's what happens when it costs more to make a show than the return you're getting for the number of eyeballs on it. it it's, it, that's the business. Everybody does that. Everybody does it. CBS does it. NBC does it. Fox does it. Netflix does it. Uh, Disney Plus does it. HBO Max does it. Everybody does that. That's the way the business works. That's how you stay in business. And I hate it because I love Warrior and I loved Winning Time. But the problem is folks like you and me didn't do a good enough job. And this, look, this is just the reality. Folks like you and me did not do a good enough job as people who loved those shows in spreading the word about those shows and try to get other people to jump on board and watch and enjoy those shows. We just didn't do the, it's real. So at some point and sometimes it's up to the fan base to spread the word about a show and to spread that buzz. And at the end of the day, I did not do a good, good enough job. You did not do a good enough job. We just didn't do a good enough job getting other people excited about it. All they can do is put out trailers, make the show as good as they can. And they made great shows with winning time and warrior. But after that, if people don't tune in and watch, and if the people who do watch aren't excited enough to get other people to come in and watch, then eventually it's just going to, it's, it's just going to get canceled. And, and that's the way it sucks. I hate that those things got canceled, but I understand it. I get it. Uh, they, uh, they just died. All right, guys, listen. We are now going to move on and start taking your live questions. I'm sure a bunch of you have a bunch of things you want to talk about with the Jonathan Major situation. We're going to get to that. But before we do, we're going to take a moment here and thank a couple of more sponsors of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast. Our friends at Factor and my mobile service provider, and they should be yours, Mint Mobile. Guys, we want to take a moment and thank a sponsor of today's video, Mint Mobile. Give yourself the gift of insane savings this holiday season with Mint Mobile's best wireless deal of the year. Right now, when you switch to Mint Mobile and buy any three-month plan, you'll get another three months for free. That's six months of premium wireless service for the price of three. And Mint Mobile lets you order and activate from home while saving tons on phone plans starting at just $15 a month. Seriously, I can't think of a better gift than turning an overpriced wireless bill into into just $15 a month with Mint Mobile. I've told you guys many times since switching to Mint Mobile, I am spending less than a third on my mobile service plan with Mint than I was on the previous big carrier who was my provider. By going online only and eliminating the traditional cost of retail, Mint Mobile passes the significant savings on to you. All plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and switch easily and effortlessly with eSIM. So again, for a limited time, buy any three-month Mint Mobile plan and get three more months free by going to mintmobile.com slash campia. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia. Guys, we, we want, want to take a second sponsor to thank a sponsor of this video, of this video Factor. Quip. This bustling Guys, you holiday know season, that good you might be looking for nutritious, habits, flavorful meals to fuel you on by delivering all the Factor, Factor essentials America's that you number one need to ready care to eat meal delivery for service example, can help you eat well for breakfast, breakfast lunch, and Guys, dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian-approved, ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while tackling all your holiday to-dos. A lightweight and sleek design for adults this holiday season with wires or bulky charger meal planning, grocery shopping. Handles shopping, and a prepping, range of cleaning up, metal hues, as well as fresh, bright never plastic frozen meals sure delivered to, make... to your door. They're ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy. Choose from 35 plus chef crafted meals every week that support a healthy lifestyle and meet your meal preferences. Looking for calorie conscious options over the holidays that don't skimp on the flavor? Try delicious dietitian approved calorie smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. And Factor isn't just for dinner. Count on extra convenience any time of the day with an assortment of 55 plus add-ons to suit various preferences and tastes. So guys, head to factormeals.com slash campia50 and use the code CAMPIA50 to get 50% off. That's code CAMPIA50 at factormeals.com slash CAMPIA50 to get 50% off. And thank you to our friends at Mint Mobile and Factor for sponsoring today's episode. 
All right, guys, let's get over to your live questions that you guys have been sending in here. And we're going to start things off here with Raymond Verrata, who writes, Marvel shouldn't be afraid of recasting majors. Star Trek does this all the time. How many Kirks and Spocks are there? Did we raise hell? Not always. Well, okay, yes, but to be fair, Raymond, that's a different situation, right? They recast Kirk or Spock when they were doing a new iteration, right? This isn't a new iteration. It's not like they ended the MCU and now they're rebooting and starting a brand new MCU and so we get somebody else. This is this would be like recasting Kirk in the middle of the original series or recasting Jean-Luc Picard in the middle of Star Trek The Next Generation, right? So it's not really the same situation, although I feel like it's perfectly okay to recast because they've already shown variants can look completely different. Not all the Loki variants look the same. Some of them look like old guys in the old classic comic book costumes. Some of them look like an alligator. Some of them look like a little boy. One of them look like Sylvie. Spider-Man variants all look different. You had Tom Holland, Spider-Man. You had Andrew Maguire, Spider-Man. You had uh, Tobey Maguire, Spy did I say Andrew Maguire? Andrew Garfield, Spider-Man, Tobey Maguire, Spider-Man, so on and so forth. So you could easily recast him. You don't even have to explain it. Kang can look different. Kang variants can look completely different, just like Loki variants can look completely different, just like Spider-Man variants can look completely different. So it wouldn't be hard for them to do. All right. Let's see. Next up, we go to Bright, who writes, uh, can't tell you how bad I want Lakeith Stanfield. I love him uh, as Kang. But if not, Marvel needs to bring him in as a villain somewhere. Listen, I believe 100% there should be a place for him in the MCU. Like even that, you know what? Haunted Mansion wasn't all that bad. That more, the, more, the recent one that was just out a few months ago. That was actually not a bad little film. But I thought Lakeith was great in that, even when he has a small role, like in um, uh, a Knives Out, right? Even when he's got a small role, he always kills it. Like, I think he is tremendously talented, and I love seeing him in anything he pops. I would love to see him pop up in the MCU at some point. Villain, good guy, doesn't matter. All right, Raymond Vrata writes, cast Terrence Howard as Kang, a tie-in to Iron Man. Yeah, you could say that. I mean, it would be fun. I don't think you're ever going to see Terrence Howard work with Marvel again, and I don't think you're ever going to see Marvel want to work with Terrence Howard again, but that would be really cool if they did that. All right, Bobby Jackson writes, John, if you ever take on any Padawans, I'd love to learn the ways of poker from you. I've always wanted to learn. Um, I, yeah, I never played poker until I moved to Los Angeles. Now, Grant, that was like 13, 14 years ago now, but my buddy soul video, Jonathan Green, who is, I've had on my show here a couple of times. He's one of my best friends. Uh, one of the very first friends I ever made when I moved to Los Angeles. Um, <coughs> he's actually the one who taught me how to play poker. And I just fell in love with the game. I love the game. Mm. I actually used to do play in chats where I would play online poker, um, and do a play in chat. And I don't know, maybe I should do that again. Maybe I should do play in chats with me playing online poker and have us chat. Uh, listen, though, I'm not the best poker player in the world. I, I, I'm not somebody who sh who should be, uh, you'd want to be a Padawan of. There are many, many, much, much, much better um, people to find to learn poker from than me. I am a casual, um, I'm a casual player who just really loves to play a couple times a month. But I'm, I'm not the right guy to learn from. Believe you me when I say that. All right. Uh, next up. Uh, we've got uh, Tosh Harvey Denal, who writes, I hope Marvel doesn't just throw Doom into Avengers 5. I really hope they recast Kang and just finish what they started. I'm going to disagree with you on that. And the reason I'm going to disagree with you is because I don't think they've done a good job with Kang so far. I really don't. Like, nothing that they have done so far has in the remotest way made me feel like a sense of dread. Like, oh no, Kang's coming. They have, like, when you look at the job they did with Thanos, from the very first moment Thanos popped on screen in the end credits of Avengers, when you got that go guy going, but to challenge them is to court death. And then Thanos turns around and smiles like you just felt the, the dread. And then when they really introduced him in Guardians of the Galaxy, you just felt it like the universe should tremble at the presence of this guy. They've done, this guy literally got punched out by Ant-Man. I, 
And so because of that, I would be perfectly fine if they decided to move. I'm not saying they will. I'm saying if. If they decided to just move on from the Kang character and go in a different direction, I would personally be perfectly okay with that. I really would. I mean, maybe there's a way, too, that they can fix it, but I would be perfectly cool if they just moved on from it. But, that, but that's just me. All right. Uh, Damaris Love writes, Marvel did what was uh, more than I can say for how AT&T handled Ezra's situation. Yeah, listen, you guys know, because I complained for ye literal years how AT&T, who were the owners of Warner Brothers, back when it all went down, when all that stuff started happening with Ezra Miller, particularly that big first incident where he was literally caught on videotape choking a girl and taking her down to the ground. Uh, first of all, what were you doing out at a nightclub during a pandemic shutdown? But uh, whatever. And then all the other drama. I think all the other drama got enabled because AT&T... They never said a single thing about it. AT&T and Warner Brothers, and AT&T at the time was the owner of Warner Brothers. They never said one thing. Their whole PR strategy about that was, shh, don't talk about it. Just ignore it and everybody will forget it and it'll go away. And all that did was enable Ezra Miller's continued bad behavior. So you weren't doing Ezra Miller any favors and you weren't doing the movie franchise any favors and it just got worse and worse and worse and worse. To Marvel's credit, they didn't do anything immediately, right? They didn't say, we're going to stand behind Jonathan Majors. They didn't say, we're parting ways with Jonathan Majors. They let the process play out a bit. There was a definitive trial happening and the moment that a guilty verdict came in, that's when they announced what they were going to do. And like I said, I have very little doubt that if they had announced that he was acquitted on all charges, I think they would have continued on with him. If they were even going to continue on with Kang at all, I think they would have continued with him. But I think they had already decided if he gets acquitted on all four charges, we move forward. If he gets found guilty of any of the charges, we got to part ways. And I and they came out immediately, decisively, and I think that was the right approach. And you're right, certainly better than the way AT&T handled the Ezra Miller situation. All right. Uh, next up, we got Acts of Dwayne writes, I hope they actually have a good plan to bring in Doom and not just drop him in without a good plan. By the way, love your hair, John. Oh, thank you. Listen, my hair... I'm going to tell you why my hair always looks like this. Because I'm lazy when it comes to my hair. I like to be able to brush my hair with a face cloth. My favorite hair was in my college days and I had hair down to here. I know it's hard to imagine today, but I had the hair down to here. I would pull it back into my guitar playing ponytail thinking I looked so cool. I miss my hair, man. I love my long flowing hair. The problem is as soon as my hair starts to get long, it has all these licks and waves and weird curls in places. And you guys have seen my hair. My hair looks just terrible once it starts getting a little bit longer. It looks just awful. So I have found, you know what I would love to do? I would love to be able to not be on camera and not be seen in public for like two years and just grow my hair out for like two years. I would love to do that, but as long as I got to be seen in public or as long as I got to be on video, I can't, I can't handle it. So I do this, just, you know, buzz it on the sides, keep it real short on top and just very easy, very easy maintenance, very easy maintenance. Uh, that's, that's the haircut I go for. All right. Thanks for that ax. All right. Next up, uh, art one must probably means Artemis writes in hindsight, Marvel shouldn't have announced the titles of the Avengers movies so early on. Kang's dynasty title will be hard to shake Majors' name. Well, you're, I mean, first of all, you're right. In hindsight, maybe that was a mistake. But other than changing the name of getting rid of the Inhumans and changing the name of Captain America Serpent Society, which was never going to be the title of that, to Civil War... Marvel has had a long history of announcing projects and then those projects happen, right? I, the, the reality is Kang's dynasty, the Kang dynasty is so far away. Avengers 5, Kang dynasty is still so far away 
that even if they, if they change the name within the next six months, by the time the movie comes out, nobody will even remember Kang Dynasty. Like if Kang Dynasty was supposed to come out in a year, it would be very, very hard to make that switch. But the reality is that, that movie is so far away it's it would be actually pretty easy for change titles and not really cause much disruption. I, at least I think so. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, I that's the way I kind of see it. All right. Next up, Alex Mercer writes, Hey, John, I think they should recast with a different actor at this point. They did with Don Cheadle and people love it. Worked out at the end. Yeah, listen, look, look, if they're still planning on moving ahead with the Kang storyline and we don't know that they are, but if they are, Absolutely, they should just recast. Don't take out Kang just because Jonathan Majors isn't there. If you're going to take out Kang, do it because the Kang story wasn't working. But if they were planning on still moving forward with the Kang character, easiest thing in the world to recast him. Again, you don't even have to explain why he looks different. Because variants can look different, right? So, again, they may have decided already to not move forward with Kang just because the Kang storyline wasn't working. But if they were going to move forward with Kang, don't pull Kang just because Jonathan Majors can't play it. It's the easiest thing in the world to recast. I mean, he's a, he's a global talent. I mean, Jonathan Majors is a sick, talented dude. And it's going to be very challenging to find an actor on his caliber. But <clears throat> change you can. So we'll see what they do. All right, next up, uh, we've got uh, Logan Stone, who sends in like a $20 super chat. Thank you, Logan, for supporting us on that level, man. And Logan writes, uh, given the Jonathan Majors, oh, hold on a second, I'm just having a quick little uh, blip here. Let me see if I can uh, fix this up. Uh, okay, there we go. Given the Jonathan Majors fallout and Kevin Feige regaining his creative control at Marvel, how soon do you think we will see a pivot in story from Marvel away from Kang? If that is the direction they elect to go. Deadpool 3? Well, I mean, no, here's the thing. If they decided they wanted to pivot away from Kang, they don't have to do anything. They don't have to do anything. Because the ending of Loki season two already kind of was the pivot away from Kang. If that's what you're intending to do again, go back and watch the ending of Kevin of, um, um, go back and watch the ending of Loki season two again, right? It ends with the TVA now being repurposed and retasked to just go out and hunt down the remaining Kangs. You know, you see more uh, Mobius there. I was like, Oh, we got this file closing the file on this one. Boom, right? So if you wanted to move away from Kang, if, and that's a big if, but if Marvel wanted to move away from Kang, you don't have to do anything else. You just go on without him because theoretically speaking, the ending of Loki season two can be your end of the Kang storyline if they wanted to do that. If they wanted to do that. All right. Uh, let's see. Next up. Thanks a lot for that, Logan. And th again, thank you for su uh, supporting us on that level, man. Gnome writes, uh, according to the Hollywood Reporter, Kang Dynasty is now Avengers 5. Wait, is the Hollywood Reporter saying offic that officially, or did they just refer to the next movie as Avengers 5? Like, what I'm asking you is, did the Hollywood Reporter come out and say, Marvel changes name to Avengers 5, or did, in the article, the Hollywood Reporter just refer to it Avengers 5? Because a lot of people for a long time, I've just been referring to it as Avengers 5. Anyway, uh, again, if that's new and recent, I'll check it out, but I haven't seen that yet. I'll, I'll go look at it afterward on the show here. All right, thanks for that, Noam. Next up, Nexus Fuel writes, Aside from the bad news today, Peter Cullen got his Lifetime Achievement Award last night, extremely well-deserved. That dude, whether it was, I mean, obviously, most iconically for being Optimus Prime, um... I mean, that he's the voice of Optimus Prime, but he also, like, I also remember him doing the intro narration for the opening of Voltron. Uh, Defender of the Universe. It's like, wait a minute, that's Optimus Prime's voice. Um, if I, and if I'm not mistaken, did Peter Cullen not just do a voice in Invincible this season? Wasn't he, like, the leader of the Alien Alliance in Invincible? Like, correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't he like Bobby Jackson just put in that 
he's also in the new like that's him right that's that's his voice doing that i could be wrong about that but i think that's him yeah bobby jack's saying yeah that's him yeah i mean I, peter cullen's voice is forever iconic and i can't believe he didn't have a lifetime achievement award until yesterday he should have had one a long time ago all right next up the robo producer writes with Kang's future up in the air, I think Marvel is reaching out to Hiddleston to fill a gap with more Loki? No. Uh, question two, interested in wrestling Sting's final match? Oh, is Sting finally going to retire? Isn't Sting like in his 60s at this point? Does anybody in the live chat know how old Sting is? Not the singer of The Police, but Sting the professional wrestler? I honestly... Uh, didn't know. Michael Gonzalez says St Sting is returning early next year. I, I don't know. Do you any guys know how old he actually is? No, I don't believe he's 84. 64 years old, says Michael Gonzalez. 64 and still wrestling. Dear heavens. I, I mean, I didn't know he was still going. I didn't. Anyway. All right. Uh, next up, Stacy's mom writes, she's got it going on, I hear. Uh, have you watched May, December on Netflix? Yes. Didn't love it phenomenal performances um and by this by the way when i say i didn't love it that's not you know shorthand for saying i hated it i didn't hate it as a matter of fact i didn't um but like i don't know it didn't live up to a lot of the hype like it's a contender for best picture of the year and everything and i don't know maybe other people feel that way that's great i i thought it was pretty good brilliant performances kind of edgy but i I didn't love it, to be honest with you. But whatever, that's just me. All right, next up. Purple Haze writes, Hey, John, I'm with you when you say the actor should service the story or the character. With that said, I hope Alan Richson be James Gunn's new Batman in the DCU. You know, I said that earlier today on the show myself. Um, And let me see if I can find it here. Uh, Alan Richson. Let's see if I can pull this up. Um... I I watched the first three episodes of Archer Archer of Reacher uh, season two uh, last night, and this dude is stupid. I mean, just absolutely stupid. This guy is Batman. <laughs> I mean, number one, first of all. He's, he's evolved into a good actor. He's a good actor. And I could totally see him as, like the way he acts as Richards, as a Reacher, I mean, adjusted a little bit and I could totally see a Bruce Wayne. I totally see a Bruce Wayne. And when you consider that, at least according to the DC Heroes stats, Batman is as physically strong as is humanly possible. Barring any um, augmentation, barring any supernatural stuff, Batman, according to DC Hero Statistics, is as physically powerful as any regular human being could be. And I'm sorry, but this dude is the peak of her human perfection. Look at him. That is freaking human perfection, right? The genetic human perfection. And uh, Mr. Pineapple saying, John has a crush. I don't have a crush. But man, I can, I can appreciate like physical superiority. And this dude is just a beast. He would make a, I think he'd make a great Batman. Again, X actor and X role. Maybe the script doesn't, isn't at all a good fit for Alan Richson. Totally. They should get whoever's right for the role. But I'm saying if tomorrow they announced that they were casting this guy to be the new Batman, I'd be totally on board for that. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we got Christopher Brickner who writes, Chargers didn't wait for offseason to change coaches. Head coach Brandon uh, Staley was fired Friday. Uh, reminder, he was hired to fix the defense. I think he failed. You know what's really funny? Uh, and I'll just touch on this quick because I know people don't like it when I talk about sports, but it's my show, whatever. The week before, he defended himself when they asked, do you think you've lost the locker room? He says, well, we're not getting blown out, so no, we're, we're competitive. And then the very next week, they got totally blown out. Yeah, so... I, I don't like seeing people lose their jobs, but it was time for them to move on. And I think it was very telling that they decided to not wait for the season to be over. All right. Demarius Love writes, X-Men was Stan Lee's way of talking about diversity 
Uh, Professor X was Martin Luther King, yeah, and Magneto was Malcolm X, hence the rumor of race change for the characters. Well, that's not why there was the rumor of the race change for the characters. But yes, Stan Lee said several times publicly that, um, I mean, first of all, the, the creation of the X-Men, Stan Lee speak, spoken many times about the analogy of what the X-Men represent, right? But he did speak several times about how Charles and Magneto were, while they were both mutants, they had very different philosophies. And Stan compared Charles to a Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, one of my all-time favorite theologians, and the other to Malcolm X, uh, the more, let's say, aggressive <laughs> of the two, right? And um, I, I think the very fact of what they represent of a society's prejudices, of society's ignorance, of society's hatreds, things like that, um, I think it would be very applicable for them if they were to do a reimagining of Charles and Magneto to have one or both or just a single one of them be a black character. I mean, it goes with the analogy very well. Or don't. I mean, either way, it doesn't matter to me, but I don't think it should matter to anybody. If they're white, they're white. If they're not white, they're not white. I don't see why it matters to anybody. Anyway, uh, next up, we've got uh, Brandon Collins who writes, John, what are your thoughts on the Iron Claw excluding the youngest brother, Chris, from the film? He killed himself two years before Carrie did, and the film just straight up pretends he never existed. Don't know. I didn't watch it. I, I have no opinion of it. Um, I had tickets to go see it. Me, Ann, and Ray and our buddy Ryan had tickets to go see it, but you guys know last week I got sick, and I couldn't go to the movie, so I didn't see it, so I have no opinion on the matter whatsoever. Since I haven't seen the point of reference for the film, I can't give any commentary on that, so I, I just don't know. And... And I don't know enough about the history about the Von Erichs um, enough. I mean, I know very surface level stuff because of the wrestling pedigree and everything, but I just don't know enough to have an opinion on it, to be honest. All right. Thanks for that, uh, Brandon. Sorry, I didn't know more. I don't know more about it to give you a valid opinion on it, but I, I can't give you a valid opinion without more knowledge. And I didn't even see the movie yet. All right. Taki 75 writes, Jeff Schneider said that Secret Wars will be the conclusion of the Avengers-based MCU. I guess that means it will be more X-Men reliant going forward. I don't know that I buy that. I don't know that I believe that. I don't think I believe that. When something makes mad money, you don't replace it. Now, listen, I could totally see a lot of X-Men stuff becoming very prevalent, but I don't see them killing off the Avengers, uh, as a, as a brand or an IP. Now I, I'm not at all suggesting that Jeff Snyder didn't hear that. I'm sure if Jeff Snyder is saying that it's because somebody told him that I'm hundred percent sure of that. I don't think Jeff Snyder is making anything up, but I would say, I don't think I'm buying whatever the person who told Jeff that is selling. I, I, I just don't believe that. I, that doesn't mean I'm right. I could be wrong about that. I don't know. I'm just speculating as a fan, like everybody else, but I have a very, very, very hard time believing that. All right. Uh, next up, Duck Duck writes, Buenas tardes. I don't know why, but I haven't finished Loki season two yet. Just isn't clicking. Uh, frustrating as hell because it's uh, improved certain aspects since part one. I enjoyed Loki season two quite a bit. Uh, and I didn't really love Loki season one, to be honest with you. I, I think Loki season two was pretty much a improvement in almost every way over Loki season one. Um, I liked almost everything about it more than I liked in season one. I have, I have some thoughts about the actual finale of the film or of the season. Like, I'm sorry. I, and I, people get mad at me for saying this. I know if I like a show, don't you dare say anything negative about it, but I'm, I'm sorry. The very ending of it in some ways didn't make a lot of sense because at the end of Loki season two, they basically portray Loki as being more powerful than any character in the MCU, like more powerful than Odin, more powerful than, well, anybody. And um, his ability to actually harness all time and realities and stuff like that, that had never, ever been remotely hinted that Loki was that powerful. 
ever remotely. And all of a sudden he's that powerful. He's a frost giant. Frost giants don't have that kind of power. Anyway, it's a minor gripe for a season that I ultimately really liked. But listen, I get it. It's not for everybody. Um, the fact that it didn't work for you didn't work for you. Nothing wrong with that. Um, I personally did quite enjoy season two, uh, even though the ending was a little bit, come on, you're kind of pulling that out of your ass a little bit. But uh, even with that, I still really enjoyed the season. I thought it was quite good. All right. Um, and actually Michael Gonzalez is saying something that, that many people say, and you're wrong. He was training to master that technique for centuries as seen in the season. No, he spent centuries trying to learn thermodynamics. He, he was trying to learn quantum mechanics. I mean, he specifically said in the show, word for word, he was talking to Ouroboros and says, how long would it take me to fully understand this quantum mechanics thing? And he said, well, to learn what I know, you got, it's going to take centuries. And that's what he did. He was not learning. And it doesn't matter how long he's trying to learn to be the most powerful being in the galaxy. Thor is thousands of years old and isn't that powerful. So no, no, don't make up excuses for the show. That is not what the show said. The show did not say he was learning to grow his power so he could literally control all of time and realities. No, he was learning quantum mechanics. Anyway, that's enough of that. Enough of that. All right. Uh, let's see here. And we're finished. Uh, well, we're almost finished here. Well, uh, Ben Schofield writes, because I, in case any of you have been trying to say, I turned off the super chats a while ago. Anyway, uh, Amazon deal with Warhammer 40k official thoughts. I never thought it wasn't official. I thought that was official a year ago. Was it not official official? Like it had some, anyway, I, I don't have any thoughts to add to that. Cause I always thought it was completely official. Maybe it was only partially official before. I'm not, um, I'm not sure. I thought it was really good. Anyway, uh, I thought it was pretty solid that it was official already. Anyway, all right. So that's it for all the questions. Because, um, I, like I said, I turned off the Super Chats about a uh, half hour ago. So I'm still going to take some time, though, to take, uh, if you guys who are in the live chat, if you got any additional thoughts or questions you want to throw in there, I will uh, I will uh, take your your questions here. So let's see. That's why I said when I said, well, this is the last question. I thought, no, 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 I'm still going to take some more. Um, uh, King Daddy Goat saying, who's your MVP vote now? If you're talking about the NFL, to me, there is only one answer to that question. It's Christian McCaffrey. Look at his stats. Do you know that he is the leading, normally the leading rusher in the league will be like 50 yards ahead of the next person or 25 yards as just a running back, Christian McCaffrey is over 200 yards, might be getting close to 300 yards ahead of the next second place person. Not to mention his receiving yards. He is the ultimate cheat code. Christian McCaffrey is the ultimate fucking cheat code in the NFL. He gets on your team, you are a Super Bowl contender. It's just that simple. You put Christian McCaffrey on your team, suddenly, look how bad the Carolina Panthers are. Once, like, they were still functioning. Take Christian McCaffrey off that team, bleh, like, they completely suck. He is the ultimate. To me, there is no other answer. There is no other answer in the MVP question. Christian McCaffrey is the MVP of the NFL, but the NFL won't have the balls to give it to him because they always give it to a quarterback. Another non-quarterback who should be considered is Tyreek Hill. But Tyreek Hill is, like Christian McCaffrey can do it all. He's a running back and a great receiver. Tyreek Hill is just a receiver, but like one of, maybe easily the best in the game right now. So I personally feel Christian McCaffrey, number one, Tyreek Hill, number two, and then maybe some quarterbacks, but the NFL always just gives it to quarterbacks. So I, I don't know what they're going to do about that. Um, let's see. Noah writes, your thoughts on the new Narnia movies coming to Netflix by the director of Barbie. Yeah, we well, we talked about that, you know, a month or two ago when the story first came out. I'll be honest with you. I don't think it's going to happen. I'm not saying I have insider information telling me it's not going to happen. I just, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen. They've announced it. They said they're doing it. But I honestly don't think it's going to happen. I mean, if they do it, they do it. I, I just don't know why. I don't think there's a big hunger out there to go back to the to Narnia. I love the original books. I'm a big C.S. Lewis fan. But I I just don't feel the hunger for it. I, I And I just don't think they're going to do it. I just don't think they're going to do it. Uh, all right, let's see. Um, 
let's see. Uh, Terev is asking, do you think Majors being out opens it back up for Ty Simpkins to come back in the MCU as Iron Lad slash Kang? No, I don't think one has anything to do with the other. I think if they wanted him in there, they could have just put him in there. They, it's not like Jonathan Majors was in the way. They could have come up with something if that's the way they wanted to go. Uh, but I, I don't think uh, I don't think that's the case. All right, Taki seventy five writes: Oppenheimer or Flower Moon seems to be the Oscar frontrunners. For me, it's it's easy. Oppenheimer's the better film. Uh, the best film of the year is still Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I stand by that. I'll have that debate with anybody. But Oppenheimer, I think, is the better movie than Flower Moon. And I really liked Flower Moon a lot. I think Flower Moon is great. Too long, but it's great. But I, I take Oppenheimer over Flower Moon. That's, uh, that's just me. All right, let's see here. Um... Uh, let's see. I'm just looking to see if there's any other questions. Um, Hayden Center says, have you heard the rumors online about Nick Cage and Eric Bana? You know what? It, there are, there are rumors online about everything. There's a rumor online somewhere that, uh, fucking, I don't know. Bill Cosby is going to come in and be Kang. If you look around on the internet hard enough, you'll find it. So I don't really pay much attention to internet rumors. Uh, let's see here. Um, oh, that's the wrong one. I didn't mean to bring up, uh, Queen Glamazon writes, John, are we getting a new Wonder Woman? Yes. At, at, I don't know when it's probably not going to be any time immediately soon, but yes, we will get a new Wonder Woman who that'll be no idea, but it won't be, um, it won't be the same one that they've been using up until now. It's not going to be gal. It's going to be somebody else. So we'll see. Um, King uh, Leo writes, do you believe in second chances? If Majors could rebuild himself in the public side in a few years, he could come back. No, 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 no. Second chance, listen, there's, there are repercussions and then there's second chances, right? The reality, let, let's put it this way. Let's say um, you and I are friends and I leave you to babysit my kid. And you forget that you're babysitting my kid when you're hanging out at my place alone. And you decide, I'm going to run out to McDonald's and get some chicken nuggies. And you leave my child alone in the house for like an hour and a half, alone, defenseless, whatever. And you, you totally forgot you were babysitting. So you come back and you start smoking in my house with my baby right there, whatever. Okay. Second chances means I'm going to be pissed off at you, really pissed off, but second chances means we can have our friendship again. But repercussions means even though we're friends again, I am never going to let you babysit my kid again. That's the repercussion, even though second chances, we're going to be still be friends. We can, you know, whatever, we'll put that behind us, but I can't have you babysit my kid again. You understand. I believe um, Jonathan Majors can get his career back on track next year, two years, three years from now, whatever. I, I think that can happen. I do believe there will be a second chance, but not to come back to the Kang role. Like that's, that's gone. That that's the repercussion that's gone. That's no longer in the picture, but yes, I, I do believe in second chances, but second chances don't mean there's no repercussions, right? There are, there are consequences to things. And you can have consequences, accept the consequences, have the consequences enforced, and then move on to second chances for other things. But, but yeah, no, I don't I don't see him coming back to play Kang again. I really don't. Uh, let's see here. Let's take uh, one or two more. Um, let's see. I'm just looking through the thing here. <laughs> no, T Terrence Howard will not be the new Kang. That's that's definitely not going to happen. He will never work for Marvel again, and Marvel will never let him work for them again. So it's that's a mutually no way that's going to happen thing um, ever. Um, uh, Red's ultimate saying, who do you think will replace Jonathan Majors? I'm not even convinced they will replace him. Like, I, I still think, and again, this is just me as a fan speculating, just a guess. I still think there's a very good chance they don't move on with the Kang character. Uh, that they could be 
done with the Kang character, that they're finished. I, I That Loki season two was the end of Kang's story. And so I think there's a very good chance they don't replace him. And if they do replace him, no idea who they're, they could literally replace him with anybody. I mean, Macaulay Culkin could play Kang because Kang can look and be different in every universe and in every reality, right? So no idea who they replace him with, but I'm still not sure um, that they will replace him at all. I think they might uh, move on. Um, uh, Iwuji, uh, Iwuji should be the new Kang. No, he, no, he can't be the new Kang. He's already the the high evolutionary. He's already in universe as the high evolutionary. I don't think you can use him as Kang at this point. Uh, let's see. Um, you know what? I think, oh my gosh, we've been going for almost two hours now. So I think it's time for us to wrap up today's show. Um, uh, this installment of open mic, we are now done with today's episode. Thank you so much for being here guys and making our little video a part of your day. Uh, don't forget to come on back. I'm sure we're going to talk more about the repercussions and what's going on as more information comes out about the Jonathan Majors ruling, Jonathan Majors being parting ways with Marvel, all that kind of stuff. I'm sure we're going to talk more about that tomorrow and other stories that are coming out right now. So I hope you can see you guys again tomorrow. Again, guys, thanks so much for just hanging out with me this afternoon. And as we sit around casually talking about movies, good to have you guys here. Uh, but that'll do it for me for now. Thanks a lot for being here, guys. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye.